so happy that we finally get to give this talk. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Greenfield. Thank you. Well, I don't have much to do because Bob pretty much covered everything. <laughs> so, um, but um, I just want to say, um, as a caveat ahead of time, that often when we think of the Mill Girls, we think of the beginning of women's uh, labor organization and the Bread and Roses strike at the Pemberton Mill in Lawrence. And I decided when I was asked to do this talk that I needed to find, as we say in academia, a hook that really interested me. So I'm going to look at this golden age of about 25 years, beginning in 1815, ending in 1840, um, prior to uh, mill girls defining themselves as laborers. Um, they define themselves during this period as wage earners, not unlike businessmen, because they were um, actually being paid an above subsistence wage in these textile mills, and um, which allowed for um, all kinds of freedom, independence from the family, and ability, purchasing power. Um, translated into one's ability to express and explore desire and things like that. So this is very important um, in terms of the beginning, I think, of women's liberation, but not necessarily the beginning of the labor movement in particular. So I will start, and I have slides. And I'm going Historians all agree, oh, bells and bonnets, mill girls both devoted and defined. Why I title this bells and bonnets will become abundantly clear, but I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> Historians all agree that farm women, the first large-scale industrial labor force in the United States, farm women comprised that labor force, um, as Bob mentioned, and it began here in this very mill. Factory agents recruited unmarried women from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Western Massachusetts. The large machinery, and this is what this picture depicts, in these massive brick buildings required large, able-bodied women, eliminating the use for children, even if they were available. Yankee men most likely would have chafed, uh, chafed at becoming inoperative and remained on farms or worked in the building trade. Also a few things, this is prior to immigration. We, it's by the 1850s that we have Canadians and the Irish and even some Polish coming in and then on towards the end of the century, more Eastern Europeans. So we don't have immigrant labor available. And unlike Europe, we can't go and drag people out of the poorhouse to work. So. Between 1830 and 1850, tens of thousands or tens of thousands of women left farm and family for factory work in the ever-growing textile industry. Yeah, again, another picture of a large mechanized loom um, and the need, again, for large, able-bodied um, folks to work those. And, particularly women in this instance. First, this paper will explore what I call the push-pull factors that resulted in this major demographic shift from farm to factory. Why did they come? Did corporate propaganda draw women away from their homes with promise of great bounty? Did declining conditions on New England farms motivate women to leave? I'll then focus on what I call the psychic shock of entering an alien world of clanging bells and noisy factory rooms. No longer did the sun, fields, and stone fences shape women's sense of time and space. How did they navigate the path from country to factory? What actions and choices transformed them into city girls? The newcomer faced the challenge of conforming to time discipline in both factory and boarding house but both the promise of independence 
with its implicit challenge to class and cultural barriers overrode, overrode any uncertainty about leaving home. Where do we first encounter these wage laborers? Right here in Waltham. On this very site, a newly designed factory that mass produced rough cotton became the model for all other factories throughout New England. Francis Cabot Lowe, this is his lovely profile and the beautiful eyelash there, <laughs> abandoned his lucrative trade with China, hoping to play a bigger role in, his eco in the economic development of this country. In 1813, on a purchased mill site and dam, he established the Boston Manufacturing Company. This company, with the aid of Paul Moody's mechanical wizardry, built the first fully mechanized and integrated factory. All costs of production, carding, spinning, and weaving were performed under one roof. Lowell's secretive and illegal observations of loom technology in Britain and Scotland provided Moody with a mental map from which he built the first working power loom in the United States. Within a few years of production, investors reaped profits and domestic manufacturer boom for the first time. This is actually um, done by a uh, very talented illustrator who worked for the Boston Manufacturing Company for a period of time, a man by the name of Isaac Markham. And it's interesting to see all of those belts and to sh in what, one of the things that's prominent, at least for me, is the belt that you see, the, the large wheel that would have been belt driven and connected to the flow of water from the Charles River. The BMC, following Lowell's direction, ensured limitless production by manufacturing cheap, unbleached cotton only. Lowell understood how little he knew about textiles and wisely avoided any complexity in the weaving process, anything that might require a high-paid craftsman, for example. His shrewd calculations paid off beyond his expectations. For the first time, factory wheat workers needed no training, swelling his ranks of laborers with the unskilled. Most of us, including myself, simply assume that mechanization allowed for unskilled labor. Not true. Well, not entirely. By accident or design, Loa made it possible for any able-bodied woman to walk off the farm and become a wage earner on the spot. These young unmarried women between the ages of 16 to 24 shared a Protestant heritage deeply rooted in the strict moral codes of, Puritan, of Prod, excuse me, Puritanism. Employers predicted a docile workforce. Certainly, Yankee women provide them with the added benefit of, it, of having already internalized hard work and obedience to authority. Many women bore out corporate expectations, others defied them to different degrees. And momentarily, I will talk about Waltham specifically, sorry, and the evidence, meager as it is, suggesting a walk-up in 1821. Prior to factory work, these some same, I'm having troubles with connecting with my microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Prior to the factory work, these same women hand spun and wove cloth for their own family's use, a process now performed by the very machinery they operated in these new industrial centers. One BMC investor, and many of these investors were known as the Boston Associates, Nathan Appleton, explained that, quote, household manufacture was so superseded by improvements in machinery, especially with the power loom. Owners considered these female recruits as temporary workers by design, rotating in new labor every year or two. And in doing so, they, main contro they maintained control over their workers and preserved a degree of harmony between labor and management. They saw potential problems with a permanent workforce, as typified by labor discontent in England's industrial centers. They wanted to avoid anything Dickensian-like. I mean, many had visited these centers and were horrified and um, hoped to provide some paternalistic um, oversight or benevolence, as they would call it, to create a better 
um, treated um, labor force, better paid, better housed, etc. Um, et Workers lived on on-site dormitories, were given access to libraries and schooling, and were under the watchful eye of matrons who enforced good conduct. Needless to say, men were forbidden access to the dorms. Recruiters wanted to assure parents that factory life not only maintained respectability, but could inspire it as well. Nearly all came for the weekly wages, unavailable on the farm or in poorly paid jobs like domestic service or teaching, and teaching at this time was seasonal and was a, a very um, poorly paid job. Um, in addition, in letters and memoirs, most women discussed the thrill of earning above subsistence wages and the independence that afforded them. Mary Paul sought her father's permission in letter after letter to go to Lowell because she was, and I quote, in need of clothes, unavailable to her on the farm. She expressed some guilt about not sending wages back to her father, but was unable or unwilling, and I quote her, to lay up savings. By the way, many women did save, and uh, there's a records of banks in Waltham and banks in Lowell, um, where there's tremendous statistics testifying to the ability of these women during the Golden Age, as I call it, uh, to save their wages. Other parents actually felt guilty for receiving money from their hardworking daughters. One father reluctantly accepted four dollars from his daughter only on the condition that it was a loan, not a gift. Also farmers in northern New England struggled to make marginally arable land productive. You can think of Rocky, New Hampshire or Rocky, Vermont. They welcomed one less mouth to feed. And some female occupations, again, such as spinning and weaving, no longer turned a profit for the home economy. So migration to factories also resulted from Appleton's shrewd observation above, or shrewd observation that I quoted earlier. According to one historian, the expansion of the factory output of cotton and woolen cloth undermined the position of women in farming families. Other women felt direct pressure to become self-supporting, and many put up wages for their marriage portion or dowry. Others used their savings for higher education, Lucy Ann put herself through Oberlin College, undermining the myth of female self-sacrifice, where women save wages for a brother's education exclusively. And this is promoted by historians. Um, they get it from a um, below offering that was, let's say, trying to promote the ideal of self-sacrifice and um, even though, in fact, most women spent their wages um, to better themselves and not others. One letter informs that her mother's new boarder came for the sole purpose of buying books. A lot of these women were avid readers. What they read was a matter of controversy, <laughs> as we'll see. Whether attracted by urban amenities or drawn towards independence from the farm family, they yearned freedoms heretofore unavailable to them. While cash wages were not entirely new, most factories or early factories like the Slater Mill in Rhode Island paid in company scrip. Workers then were forced to buy at the company store with a limited choice of unessential goods and an unfair control of prices. With cash wages, Yankee women could shop and buy not just necessities, but luxuries and simple treats for pure pleasure. Making choices in the marketplace led one worker to claim, and I quote, that she felt not unlike a male businessman. <laughs> to focus a bit on Waltham, for the purpose of this Labor Day event, I have evidence of the wages earned as early as 1820, on average about 240 per week. And to break, I've broken this down, and what you see is that there's about 64 females in the combined carding rooms. They make between two to 350 a week. The combined spinners, about 57 females make a dollar 35 to 250. 
The weavers in room 102, there's about 102 of them, make about $2 a week. And the overseers, I couldn't help, and I will use, where's my, uh, oh yes. So, you have the weaving room, the spinning room, the carding room, the weaving room, the spinning room, and then you have what's interesting. There are rooms where men work, and then there are the overseers who are all exclusively there to watch over the women. And they are paid special wages. I found the word special wage interesting in, in, in the sense that it values the overseer as someone between a wage laborer and management. Um, the, uh, this, I think it's in this next, yeah, this is one of my favorite photographs. It kind of um, is a little bit anachronistic because it's a picture of women working in this mill, but in the 1890s. But it's instructive in many ways. And if you look at this, you know, photography, most of you know, is never about simply presenting facts. Photographers make choices. They are trying to also convey meaning through the choices that they make with light, with um, focus, um, composition. And is there anything that strikes you about this um, long, well, this is the kind of conditions women work in, and I'm gonna talk about that soon. If you look at all of this cotton, it actually created clouds of cotton dust that led to something called brown lung disease. Um, it could be simple coughing, asthma, but could even lead to fever and other more serious ailments. Um, also, you see, you know, this kind of dress that they wore um, led to potential accidents as um, long dresses um, could be caught, get, get caught in machinery, etc. But you have a lot of women um, pushing up the sleeves and um, not wearing bonnets in the factory um, to try to assert some control over their physical experience in the factory. But what's in, the, in focus in this uh, image? Anybody? The man, the, man. the man in the background. And he's the overseer. So the statement really is that they are constantly under the watchful. That's the eye of the painting, of the picture, of the photograph. And they are under his constant gaze. Overseers were given tremendous power. If someone simply acted with too much personality, they, they could easily be fired. Um, you, you wanted people, there was, there was often this concern that with this freedom and with these wages to spend and express the desire that women would have too much of a personality and that was a problem. And the overseers could keep them out for having too much of a personality and I'm gonna make, read this quote. Um, it came off a website, I didn't vet it, but the accuracy of the web writer's description of the overseer's job just made me laugh because this is the way women talked about it. This guy's job is to make sure women do mind-numbingly repetitive work in an enclosed space for long hours and don't accidentally enjoy themselves while they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we translate, if I, I'm gonna go back, how do we translate this wage data into something meaningful? A decade later, workers at Lowell earned a bit more as inflation drove wages up to approximately $3.25 a week. Working approximately 73 hours a week, six days a week, an operative earned just under five cents an hour. 
Yet during the early 19th century, necessities were cheap, were cheap room and board cost $1.25 on average, leaving $2 to spend or save as they wish. Here I'm relying on a distinguished labor historian, Thomas Dublin, for calculating the true value of wages that might seem pilfering to us today. Further, Dublin provides a lens for roughly assessing wages at the BMC. The BMC first produced cotton in 1815 and thrived over the next six years without any change in women's wages, despite an ongoing recession between 1815 and 1821, one of the most crippling in our nation's history. Banks were failing because of unpaid farm loans and general cash shortages, leading to great fluctuations in the price of cotton. While the BMC rolled this wave of economic uncertainty to the near bitter end, the company apparently cut wages by 15% in 1821 without notice. Company records failed to record this wage cut and the ensuing walkout. But the recession itself, combined with eyewitness testimony, provide enough circumstantial evidence so not to dismiss this action out of hand. Isaac Markin, who I mentioned before, who was hired by the factory, um, provides some of that eyewitness testimony. He recounted the events in a letter to his brother. He complained, and I quote, that the management had all the lordly and tyrannical feelings that were ever felt by the greatest despots of the world. He continued to explain that men's wages were cut without notice and that the same trick was played off the girls. But they, as one, revolted and the work stopped two days in consequence. Walkouts were more spontaneous eruptions and organized strikes. While well-planned strikes set out specific demands, a walkout expressed immediate outrage, not prolonged dissatisfaction. Presuming women did stop work for two days, they understood, if implicitly, the hypocrisy of corporate paternalism, and through their actions shattered the ideal of a docile workforce. Factory work was tolerable only because of the wages they worked. <coughs> Why stay? For them, unlike later immigrants, the risk was minimal. They were temporary workers with families not far away. Most Yankee women of this free-spirited generation embraced the rise of industrial capitalism. High wages and independence went hand in hand. Um, a man by the name of Orestes Brownson, a labor reformer, launched an attack against the mill girls, equating la wage labor with female debasement. Using the only vehicle at her disposal, the wall offering, which I'll talk about in a minute. An operative effectively defended women's choice, freely made to earn money at places like Waltham and Lowell. And I quote, we are under restraints, but they are voluntarily assumed, and we are at liberty to withdraw from them whether they become galling or whenever they become galling or irksome. Neither have I ever discovered that any restraints were imposed upon us but those which were necessary for the peace and the comfort of the whole and for the promotion of the design for which we are all collected, namely to get money and as much of it and as fast of it <laughs> as we can. <laughs> When the anonymous author states that any restraints imposed upon them were necessary for the peace and comfort of the whole, we encounter a prevailing sentiment of the low offering, one of corporate compliance or allegiance. The monthly magazine was established by working women in the textile mills in Lowell, Massachusetts, and other monthly magazines like it were established at other sites. For some women, writing for the offering made factory life tolerable. While essays range from romantic poetry to botany to morality tales, together they furthered the offering's mission, promote self-improvement, and preserve purity in action and deed. Parables paraded through the offering pages, and I'm sorry about this alliteration. <laughs> Parables paraded through the offering's pages, preaching against vice, and in a sense, policing their own community. They extolled self-sacrifice, pleasure meant sending wages home, 
women who bought too much finery, goo or scandalous love novels had last their, lost their way and needed rescue. <laughs> In this cartoon, now as you see here, she's carrying a book, and that is not just a symbolic, but a literal representation of their devotion to self-improvement through reading nonfiction. Anybody who bought books and wasted money on novels for entertainment or that inspired any kind of desire um, were considered fallen. So you could have a book, but you needed a certain kind of book. Um, here, in this cartoon published by the Boston Courier, the editor satirized the overly prudish tone of the offering. The monthly is thrown to the floor in a symbolic gesture of rejection and ignored like so much garbage in favor of the how-to sex manuals of the day and novels of love and desire. Perhaps they're poking fun at the stark and exaggerated contrast between gentility and coarseness in such didactic literature as the offering. And it's what's so funny about this is that, you know, the posture is terrible. Um, the attic, which was the least desired place, as one factory operative said, as you move up, that is, as you gain seniority, you move down to the better ventilated and bigger rooms. But they're up hiding, you know, not under the watchful maze, gaze of the matron, having a laugh, a little too much personality, a little too much interest. If you look... <laughs> I don't think the low offering would cause her eyes to, like, bulge like that. <laughs> and they've all taken off their bonnets, they just hung them over the rafters. And, uh, but also what's accurate in these rooms, you know, women slept two to three to a bed. Um, the newcomers did become, begin in the attic, but mind among the spindles, factory girls study. Amy, is that a corset on the floor? Yeah, can you actually think they're corsets? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of bar, bra, bra burning. Um, yeah. which I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I say that a little bit later. Still, to return to the original essay, we encounter a voice of honesty and authenticity in defending the shrewd, self-serving choices women made to earn money, and a lot of it, a fleeting departure from homespun tales of good girls and bad girls in the law offering. The old offering never attacked the factory directly or indirectly. However, other women expressed more defiant feelings and unresolved anxieties about factory work in poems, letters, and memoirs. Perhaps their most frequent grievance concerned factory time measured by the constantly ringing bell. As one historian explains, the bell tower stood as a visible and audible symbol of the new time discipline ushered in by the Waltham Lowell factory system. Paul Revere's North End Foundry cast the bell placed atop the first mill building here in Waltham in 1814. Henry Hooper, one of his apprentices, replaced it when it cracked in 1858. And this is the actual Henry Hooper bell, and we have it as part of our collection in the front room. And here is a timetable from the Holyoke Mills. If a minute late to the factory, they would be locked out and lose their wages for the day, or perhaps fired. The company bell rang at 4.40, they had to be in at 5 a.m. After two hours, workers rushed back to the boarding house for breakfast. And work started again at 7.30. At noon, they had a 30-minute break for lunch, and then they were back on the job to leave at 6.30 or 7 p.m., depending on the season. After work, the girls enjoyed communal supper and had time for reading, letter writing, some shopping, and doing wash. At 10 p.m., house mothers imposed curfew. If they violated that curfew, 
they were often, house mothers were told to report this violation to the company and they could be fired for that as well. The shift from their former task-based life on the farm to a time-based one in the factory might be likened to a shockwave, a traumatic encounter with a brave new world few had yet to navigate. While farm life required intensive and at times backbreaking work, laborers more easily accepted their lot in part because those lives were not measured by an external force, the clock. In Winslow Homer's painting, Old Mill, Old Mill or the Morning Bell, the central figure is symbolically poised, poised excuse me, between an agrarian past and an increasingly depersonalized industrial present, symbolized by the bell here. Homer followed the realist painters in Europe, and despite the seeming idealism of rustic nature, his paintings balance classic components of light line spatial organization with an effort to remain true excuse me, to his subject matter. On the very right, a group of women, not clearly defined, are gathered together for a bit of gossip. They are anchored in earth on the very margin of the scene. They signify the past and provide a marked contrast to the fashionably garbed women luminous and confidently moving along the straight path, asserting her independence, while ironically falling without detour the shiny bell. She's going past the mill. This is a defunct mill. And she's being called, or, or let me back up and put it this way, that in following this path, she follows the shining bell, golden almost, as if it were the North Star. But it's the beacon of corporate power, and it hangs in the sky. If you look very closely, this was a device that Homer used. It's detached and floating, and it's a trop tropic or symbolic reference to an uncertain future that we can't see beyond the old defunct mill. So, if you have any other observations, please let me know. We can go back to this painting. But how did they adjust mentally and physically without any gradual orientation to bell time after a relatively short journey from the farm? One thing I want to do with this talk is we often talk about the mill girls once they get to the factory and don't talk enough about what their farm lives were like before they got to the factory and the transitions that they had to make. So the following images, these are Homer images, represent moments of farm life suspended on canvas, from gathering sheep um, to resting among the wildflowers to apple picking. This is a farm he visited in upstate New York called the Hutton Farm. Sometime, and I'll go back, Mark the rhythm of daily activities on a farm, on the farm, from dawn when work began to dusk and darkness when activities halted. Seasonal changes determine how long one worked and what one produced. Planting fields for harvest, raising sheep for wool from spring to fall. In the winter, um, general repairs for men and other maintenance and food stocking activities for all. And without any automation or machinery, an exhausted horse might determine quitting time. Laboring outdoors meant responding to irregular weather patterns. Work might be suspended during a sudden and dangerous storm. Tasks varied over the course of the day, and women saw the product of their labor as sheep turned into wool, for example. A woman might milk cows, plant a kitchen garden on the farm, but would tend one machine in the factory all year long and never see the product of their labor. Patterns of work on the farm were more irregular and informal if demanding. Small breaks from work and a bit of gossip rove to the daily rigors of farm production. 
As if in a time machine, these women hopped the fence, leaving the informal tempo of farm life and reappeared at the factory gate, a world demanding regular and constant obedience to the taskmaster of time. In both painting and lithograph, Homer depicts the bell, and here's the bell as if it were um, the new church. Um, it is actually the fact that when that in depicting um, the cupola here and that the bell reaches the very top of the lithograph indicates again its position in terms of the hierarchy um, from the women to the factory to the bell as if it had omnipotent power and force to regulate people's lives. In both painting and lithograph again, Homer depicts the bell as a timekeeper, an instrument of capitalism and its power to organize inputs for great profit. And the mill girls, through poems, chants, letters, and stories, lament the tyranny of the bell, vent their rage against the bell, and reluctantly accept its noisome intervention in their lives. In the following poem, the outdoors or nature vie with the factory and its bell for the attention of this particular woman. Um, in fact, one thing I want to say as an aside, this poem was written um, for a magazine much like the Lowell Offering, and the editor of this poem said, again, it was one instance when that magazine um, accepted something for publication that spoke with more authenticity than typical. In the first stanza, the worker feels momentarily uplifted by winged melodies, but the bell draws her away, in a sense, away from her past. Loud, the morning bell a ringing, up, up, sleepers, haste away, yonder sits the red breath singing, but to list we must not stay. In the next stanza, the poet captures the sense of dread one might feel when waged a loss the seconds late to the factory gate. Sister, haste, the bell is tolling, soon will close the dreadful gate, then alas, we must go strolling through the counting room too late. And there's some fun and irony here. You don't go strolling through the counting room. But it reminds me when I was in school of the bad boys that had to be sent to the um, principal's office. And it was like a, the workers practice of um, slowing down the process because now that they were out of the classroom, you know, they were gonna just kind of stroll and take their time and, you know, um, so, if they have to be sent to the counter room because they're late, well, they're not going to rush there. They'll stroll there. She continues and says, now the sun is upward climbing. What's interesting about this piece is she's always aware in a way that we who have lived primarily urban lives hardly ever are. She's always aware of where the sun is at any given point in the day. Now the sun is upward climbing, and the breakfast hour has come. Ding, dong, ding, the bell is chiming. Hasten, sisters, hasten home. Quickly now, we take our ration, for the bell will babble, and bells don't babble, people babble, for the bell will babble soon. Each must hurry to her station, there to toil till weary noon. The stanzas above capture the dehumanization of clock time. Being forced to rush a meal constitutes a violation of basic human needs. And a basic human need extended beyond bodily nourishment to mental nourishment as well, evidenced in the following poem. Hark, don't you hear the factory bell? Of, in wit, of wit and learning, tis the knell. It rings them out, it rings them in, where girls they weave and men apparently they spin. Of wit and learning tis the now, when you use the word now, it's usually a, de a death now, a death now to learning. The corporation actually outlawed reading in the workroom because women, um, your average worker, well, most workers, most of the reading material apparently that was confiscated were Bibles, which was quite unfortunate. But, 
But anything like a Bible that constituted distraction from the clockwork running of the machinery um, was a problem. And so they finally outlawed any type of reading material. As an act of subterfuge or even covert disobedience, women at one mill covered the windows with newspaper. The supervisor, unaware that under his very nose, women, women gleefully read these window gems, as they call them. Others attach favorite poems to machinery where it wouldn't be detected. These efforts to regain control over how time was spent in the workroom, efforts to thwart the clock were few and far between. Such acts of disobedience are precisely compelling and heroic given the generalized sentiment of having to obey time discipline with little recourse. In the following stanza, one worker holds little hope for self-determination as obedience to bell time left her feeling little more than an automaton. Up before the day at the clang of the bell, out of the mill by the clang of the bell, into the mill and at work, in obedience to that ding-dong of the bell, just as though we were so many living machines. Many women express willingness to work long hours under demanding conditions, yet the bell required an adjustment to time so completely alien to them. When it won them into work before the sun had risen, for example, they launched a bitter repudiation of a system requiring a total mental and physiological reorientation to the passing of the day. In the words of a mill girl, in fact, this essay did get finally published, but she initially submitted it to the Lowell Offering, and as it says, the editress rejected it. Through the winter months, one is required Excuse me, through the winter months, one is required to rise, partake of the morning meal, and be at one station in the mill while the sun is yet sleeping behind the eastern hills. The bell was a safe way to express objections to factory conditions without risking jobs by being blackmailed for anti corporate sentiment in boarding house or workroom. For workers, time orientation again led to severe penalties, dismissal or loss of wages for showing them up a minute late or so to work. Punctuality rose in value and signified reliability in the modern world. Perhaps the stanza most often repeated, that is, in any bell poem, I find the stanza again and again and again. So I call it the worker's chant. The factory bell begins to ring and we must all obey and to our old employment go or else be turned away. It's as if one sense of alienation that results from the bell is a shared experience and provides worker solidarity of a type. And old is an interesting it's interesting to say to, old our, to our old employment go, because what old connotes is not old old chronologically. It connotes something familiar, and all newcomers will soon joy, join in an expression of solidarity against forces beyond their immediate control. So I see this as something that's repeated so often it becomes almost a badge of honor to be able to recite that chant and to be to learn that chant as a newcomer coming into the factory um, and to actually begin to aspire to um, other women who have become used to the ways of the factory and have begrudgingly accept the belt in their lives. The boarding house and I'll finish soon. Served as a point, because I have to get to the following hours, of entry for work in the mills for these newcomers, and most importantly, facilitated the transition from farm to factory. Harriet Farley, who became an important editor of the Lowell Offering, um, actually published her initial encounters with Lowell in the law offering under the pseudonym Susan. And we see two things going on. Um, and I'm going to read some from these letters from Susan. Is that 
there's a real honest and very insightful understanding of the world that she's now entered. And there's also a way in which she sanitizes aspects of it as well. So, departing from New Hampshire, she's jolted over rocks and hills, but feels renewed by the sight of Lowell's lights twinkling through the gleam. The boarding house matron, a sweet and nurturing mother figure, provides camphor for her headache because the travel is so wearing and she needs some camphor or something to make her feel better. Her claim that all matrons were fairly disposed, fit were fairly disposed, excuse me, smacks of propaganda typical of the low offering. She immediately, though, calls into question quite astutely her preconceived notions of the city is something new and utterly, utterly unlike the country. Residents were not indifferent and cold, and the textile complex had yet to overrun the country that bordered its margins. And what's interesting is that you hear, you have the trees and you have, this is, this is um, actually a more, uh, and, and if you can see in the background, there's hills. So as they come into the factory, it's sort of coming in to something that's much more village and country-like. And then they move on into a very regularized world reflected by the canal and by the, um, the and, and also by the way the factory itself is structured window after window after window. So there's sort of this way in which the factory imposes a regularity on the environment, be it on the margins, to begin to see that we're in a transition from that regularity um, and have not fully passed into it. She, again, she says residents were not indifferent and cold. Um, neither was she impressed, it took a lot to impress her apparently, by the train from Boston, not the streak of lightning she anticipated. Perhaps not intimidated by her environment, she does experience herself as an outsider when comparing her country dress to the smart, stylish looking little girls. And if you look at this, what you can see is this, these are people just off the, <laughs> just off the farm. Um, she has a shawl, she doesn't have a fancy bonnet, she's looking sadly at a past, very uncertain, unsure about what's to, what might happen to her um, and how she might fit into these very stylish women here in the front with great posture and uh, self-assertion and sort of... Uh, anticipating work, um, perhaps without, not without, perhaps not with joy, but with a certitude that this is something that they want. And I will quote Captain Basil Hall from England, who was an observer, and marveled at their pretty attire, glittering with showy colored gowns and gay bonnets, with an air of lightness and elasticity of step, implying an obvious desire to get to their work. Those of us, again, Susan goes on, that just to come off the hills, wear an old-fashioned bonnet, speak with country twang and phrase, and know only one fabric. We put on, and she's being funny here, but it's also the truth. We put on our woolen gowns in the morning and our better woolen gowns in the afternoon. <laughs> Country twain. Amazed by the girls wearing velvets and furs and plumes and bugles and all, she dryly mocks the fancy dress, still understanding the need to get, as she says, the rust off, out of her woolens and into a new bonnet as described below. And this is perhaps one of my favorite quotes. When I went out with Mrs. C, the boarding house matron. She made me put on one of her girls' bonnets because mine did not turn up behind and out of the ears. And she said, it's OS instead of OK. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody know what OS is? Out of style. <laughs> Well, as I walked along and saw all the beautifully dressed ladies, I thought within myself that with bonnets and dresses of an old style, they too would not be passable. And in the award-winning 
So there's, and, and this is a close up to show you the straw bonnet was in style because it revealed the face, it didn't cover, it was pretty and light and had a nice band around it. Um, and in the award winning children's novel, Liddy, the main character, a young girl just off the farm, also expresses amazement at how, and I quote, fancy and sophisticated the mill girl's dress. Liddy's farm fashion marked her as both new and unacceptable style matter. The boarding house matron warned Liddy that the mill wouldn't hire her until she shed her farm attire. The stylish bonnet, and this is the conclusion coming up, <laughs> marked one's acceptance into the world of mills and boarding houses. It signified a farm girl's successful transition from the old to the new. One newcomer with relief replaced her old-fashioned shawl with a scooter bonnet, something that was in style. At the same time, as modern consumption dictated taste, newcomers might surrender to peer pressure out of a need or desire to conform and not be sidelined. One might also argue that their purchasing power opened up opportunities for self-expression through dress. In fancier clothing dangerously challenged cultural norms, the possible breaking down of class barriers between the lady and the mill girl. For one very unhappy mill girl, the bonnet signified oppression, not freedom of expression, not unlike a prison uniform dictating her lifestyle. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly just show you, it's the factory girl song, and I, I don't want to belabor this, but at one point she says the first thing she's going to do when she leaves the factory is take her bonnet off, and it's kind of akin to brown. Bar, bar, Brought Bernie in the 60s to take one's bonnet off. Uh, by also, she says she's going to get married, she can't go back to the old country because by 1838 there was a panic that actually ruined many farms in New England and women did not have the same choices. So we by 1840, we're at the end of the golden years. But during a period of nearly 25 years, as I said at the beginning, mill girls did not hesitate to enjoy their newfound independence. Now free from the patriarchal control of father or husband, now free to spend cash wages on themselves, whether improving their attire or saving for college. In the end, not only did many women successfully negotiate the world of the unknown, but many made it over to fit their needs. Thank you. Mill girl. Um, again, one to two years. One to two years. And also what I found is that women would work the winter and then they go back to Vermont to enjoy the summer. The employ they were in such demand that they could actually um, come back and get their same position or a position that paid a wage that was um, absolutely acceptable to them. So this is something I learned from letters that you don't really hear about, that they made choices to leave and go back to the farm. Um, it was a good time in the summer. Women often actually, who didn't need these wages, would write letters saying, now that you've all left, we're really lonely and men have started to leave and, and migrate westward, whatever, and we don't have bows anymore to um, drag our sleds around and, um, or sleigh riding. And they complain of the lack of um, companions and like, can we come to Lowell? Because we'd really like to hang out with you. And of course the parents say, go teach, it's more respectable. We're not just sending you to Lowell because it's some kind of adventure and some kind of way of having fun with your friends <laughs> because they've all started to leave. But you get that in letters too. We'd really like to come and, and hang out with you as if this is a great adventure and not some really hard working um, experience of tremendous endurance, so. Yes? There was um, a recession 
But as several things happened at the same time, what the recession did was in order to maintain profits, um, mills started to uh, introduce speed ups so the machines were going at a faster pace, more dangerous, very hard um, to keep up with them. Women were being asked to work more machines, maybe not two to three, but maybe four to six. So the conditions were deteriorating for them. By the mid 19th century, immigrants who had no choice were willing to work under difficult conditions for lower wages because for the first generation it was survival that was at stake. Um, for the Yankee women um, who did have choices um, to go into either to go back to the farm, to go out west, um, there are um, accounts of women going out west actually and then becoming full-time school teachers as the common school edu education became um, very prevalent in Massachusetts earlier than any other state, probably again by the 1840s. If you were a school teacher, it became more of a profession and not something you did seasonally. So there were other options and opportunities. Yes? Not that it would have been reported, but did you find any instances of sexual harassment by the overseers? It wasn't reported, but I'm sure there was. Um, this one interesting woman I didn't have it, I didn't talk about, but her name's Delia, and uh, we have evidence of the letters written by her family to her because they were absolutely beside themselves, as any mother and father might be, that she was, and this is in fact true, seeing a married man. Now there's the famous a morality tale, that, well it is based on fact, and it takes place in Rhode Island, and it's a cautionary tale where a woman did become pregnant and died um, through the process of that pregnancy. And um, in Rhode Island, people know about that story, and it was used as a cautionary tale to say, don't stray too far because look what might happen to you. So that was an example of someone who was taken advantage of, exploited sexually, and, um, and she either died or committed, I think she committed suicide, but this is not made up. I mean, this is this is true. And I might not have all the facts right, but it did happen. Did the Millville ever formally mean that? Yes, in um, the, the Female Labor Reform Association in Lowell was as formal as a union as you might get. But unions really didn't know how to organize. <laughs> at that time, but they did work for specific goals, like the, a 10 hour day, and they were successful in that particular goal. Um, what we see is the beginning of a consciousness that we're the proletariat, and we're going to strike, um, not just walk out. Um, and to have that kind of consciousness was new in America. Uh, something that um, laborers in England had an awareness of much earlier on. So that was the shift I was talking about. We're not just women off the farm trying to make a quick buck. We're actually part of the proletariat. It's a, a emblem of pride, and we are going to assert ourselves through strikes and protests, and particularly later on, the Bread and Roses strike in the Lawrence Mills in Pemberton. And any other questions along those lines? Mm -hmm. Would you say that the women who came to work in the mills intellectually were at a higher level than some of the women in that they no. came to earn money, to go to school, to buy books, and to learn how to organize? To me, that's, you know, constantly well, some, they're at a higher level than... Well, know. what we do know is that these women only had a smattering of formal education, but they were readers. 
a majority of them were. Some came to edify themselves by reading instructive literature or learning about botany or whatever, or the new scientific inventions of the day. Some came purely to entertain themselves. So the motives for reading were very different. But they were certainly, reading was something that many of them shared um, what the low offering editors thought about what you read. I think that those who wrote for the low offering saw themselves as the genteel worker trying to reform the more coarse sister amongst them. Yeah. Yes? It was above subsistence wage. The two dollars that I said Dublin talks about was actually went a long way at that time. It was a very, it had a lot of value. Um, you know, to hear that and try to compare that to anything today, you know, it's just completely anachronistic. It doesn't translate. Um, the fact that a woman saved money to put herself through Oberlin College on a $2 to $3 wage, I think, lends evidence to how far that money went and how disappointed they were when they wages were cut. When it was below subsistence, you see the putative or supposed walkout in 1821. They were there because the wages were good and they were willing to work under oppressive conditions um, and exchange that labor for wages that allowed them to become independent, to become agents of their own destiny, etc. And that's what I found out during this golden age, that this was in fact, you, I have more and more testimony about this in letters, but there was only so much primary primary material I wanted to bring into the talk today. Yes? Well, the other physical dangers were, well, one woman <laughs> um, in a letter says, well, my friend coming into work slipped on the ice, cracked her head and died. And then a tram or some kind of um, moving vehicle, hit another worker on her way to work and he or she died. And then a male worker working with the bales that weighed a couple hundred pounds, one fell on his head and he died. And it was just days of dying in the mills. There were no safety precautions. The shuttles, it, initially there was no, um, nothing um, controlling the shuttle. They, they, over the years, they had safety devices so the shuttle wouldn't go flying off the loom, but often did and hit people in the head, <laughs> kill them, or cause concussion. Um, I think that women were very susceptible to lung diseases. Um, also, you know, at night, when they made them work at night, this, they, these are um, oil burning candles and to be in a hot room during the summer and to have that oil and, you know, the effluent from that, you know, again, was a real health problem. And then being caught in the machinery, because at that time, um, it was considered um, uh, unwomenly to show too much skin, so you had to wear dresses at least down to the ankle. Um, you'd be kicked out if you knew. And I, I used to work for the Exactly. 
also the noise, it's not something, some people were like, wow, it's so exciting to be in, in Lowell, like all the noise from the factory, what a great new experience. Others were like, oh my God, can you imagine as wooden, um, as the original wooden, um, what do you call them? Looms became metal because the stress on the wooden loom is they move very quickly um, and intensely, the, the wood would break down. So then you have a room full of metal looms. And like what I think is so funny is today you go in to Lowell, to the boot mill, and they'll have like maybe three of them working and they give you earplugs. Well, women were working with hundreds of looms in rooms or dozens and dozens and nothing to protect their ears. So there was noise pollution in a way that we would never tolerate today as well. Yes. No, actually a lot of women were like, you read, I'm going to go out on the night. There's nighttime activities. There's things to buy. Um, I'm going to go courting. What you see here is, because I, I, I do history of childhood as one of my fields of expertise, it's almost a hundred years before the whole concept of adolescence, this extended period of leisure. Um, where um, young people court or test the boundaries. You see these women doing that here because there's no parental authority. It's one of the reasons why they leave. There's the bell, there's the overseer, but the very fact, and a lot of historians make much of this, that there's no parental authority means what you see for a couple, for almost uh, one generation at least, is women being beginning to experiment with boundaries, beginning to court, beginning to date, not doing the things that they're expected of them, to read, to sew, to wash their clothes at night. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think so because what happens is the idea was that women were turned to the farm to marry those men. Well, as they became more citified, they married the handsome mechanic in the room next door. <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of testimony about that. They're like, I want to go back there. And, um, you know, and, and so I think there was concern that there would be, you know, an endless supply of bachelors. But what you have, like during, again, when I talked about that major panic in 1838, you know westward migration begins in the 1830s and 40s, so as farmland for those men becomes um, a less and less viable choice. They're in search of better land, and many of them leave with families or with cousins or with relatives west. So that's also a major movement. You have two major migrations going on from farm south into the mill factories and westward onto better, hopefully better lands and opportunities um, for producing cash crops and things like that. Well, I've enjoyed this evening. It was much anticipated. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad in this weather I won't go out, so I'm glad you all came. <laughs>